Hi, I'm Cyril Chilias, the Bilingual Learning and Development Specialist at CEREC. And on behalf of CEREC, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today is the last webinar in our webinar series, and we are excited to say that we went over a dozen of registration coming from around the world, so that's awesome. And you may want to watch for a new free series in the, on the book in 2020. But today, for our last webinar, we are delighted to have Tom Lucan live with us from New Zealand, who will talk about the acceptance and commitment therapy. But before Tom gets started, we would like to take a few moments to introduce you to CEREC for those of you who were not with us for the two first webinars. CEREC is a charitable organization that focuses on education and research in career counseling and career development in Canada. We invest in an ambitious research and learning agenda by funding projects to develop innovative resources like the Career Theories and Model at Work book, as well as creating learning opportunities like this webinar series to build the knowledge and skills of career professionals. The CEREC has three main programs. The Canexis National Career Development Conference held in Ottawa, Canada and coming up again this January. The carryrise.ca website, which features the top news and fuel in the field, with a French version called orientaction.ca, and the Canadian Journal of Career Development, which is free to access. You can learn more about all of the CEREC work and resources at CEREC.ca. Now, some quick housekeeping notes. If during today's webinar you have any questions, please enter them in the questions chat box you can see on your screen. Tom will respond to them at the end of the webinar. In a week from now, we will email you a copy of the presentation slide as well as the recording of the three webinars of the series. We also encourage you to engage with this webinar on social media using this popular Twitter hashtag that you can see on your screen. Now, bringing the career theories and model at work book to life will not have been possible without the tremendous work of the three co-editors, Nancy Authors, Merrick McMahon and Robert Arnold. And today, I'm delighted to have Nancy Authors. We've recorded an introductory video from Australia. Hello, and welcome to CEREC's webinar series on career theories and models at work, ideas for practice. My name is Nancy Arthur, and I'm joining you today from the University of South Australia in Adelaide. The project, Career Theories and Models at Work, Ideas for Practice, was developed with two goals in mind. First, we wanted to provide a, a resource that would enhance career practitioners' foundation of theory. Second of all, we wanted to develop a, a resource that was very practical. With colleagues Roberta Nolt from Canada and Mary McMahon from Australia, um, we decided to enlist the expertise of our colleagues from more than nine countries and four continents to add to the international perspectives in the field. The resource offers 43 chapters, each containing a different theory or model of career development. Within each chapter, there's an overview of the theory or model, an original case study, an analysis of a case study, and also uh, a page full of practice points. We hope that you'll find this resource to be very useful in your work setting. For today's webinar, we're focusing on chapter 19, Tom Lucan from the Netherlands will be presenting on an innovative acceptance and commitment approach to career theory and practice. Why, what, and how? I hope that you'll enjoy today's webinar. I wanna give a big thanks to CEREC for sponsoring our book project and for sponsoring the webinar series on career theories and models at work, ideas for practice. And we thank Nancy for her intro and are now delighted to have Tom deliver his presentation today. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Sarek, for <coughs> giving me this opportunity. Thank you also, the audience, the people who participate in this webinar. And I would like to start with a question to you. Cyril, you want to show the first question? And I'm happy to share the result with you. So we got 65% uh, of people answering, I know practically nothing about ACT. 26% say, I know a few things, 
about ACT. Four uh, percent, I know the six core processes, and four percent, I use element of ACT, and only two percent, I am a skilled ACT practitioners. Okay, thank you very much. It's good to know that uh, I really have to to start a little bit from the beginning. Uh, there are many, many people in the audience that know li a little about ACT, so I will have to take that into account. But let, me, let us first start uh, with the why question. Uh, the, the content of my uh, webinar is why, what and how. And in the announcements, I have promised uh, to put a lot of attention on the why. So let's start with that. And the why um, has to do with the paradigm, the paradigm that is dominating our field. Everything in our field seems to be clustered around these words, uh, self-knowledge, and the idea that if you know yourself, if you know what you want, and if you know what your abilities are, and if you know about the world, the alternatives in the world, then you can make vocational choices and career self-direction will come about. These are things that a thinking I or a thinking self, some instance uh, probably in our head, does by collecting information, uh, understanding this information, deciding, planning and executing. This is a very old idea. Uh, Parsons, uh, Frank Parsons, who in 1909 wrote these words and who was considered a founding father of our field. He said uh, that what you need is a clear understanding of yourself, knowledge of the different lines of work, and then true reasoning, and then uh, that's what is necessary for a wise choice of a vocation. So it's old, perhaps even much older, Plato, Descartes, uh, but it's still standing. This paradigm is still dominant in our field. I mentioned a few examples, a few examples only. Cognitive information processing theory. We see there a central role for knowledge and thinking. The narrative approach of career questions. For example, the career construction theory and practice uh, as put down by Savikas. Um, we see that there, he says there is a self uh, that is made by self-conscious reflection through language. Um, and that self writes an autobiography uh, knowing your life, uh, putting words to that in an autobiography, and then distilling a life theme from that uh, or a career theme, then you can um, uh, deduct goals from that. That's about uh, the essence of the narrative approach. Also, very recent, uh, very good, I think, efforts to put system theories at work. Um, in a later part of the webinar, I will show that, that system theories are promising for developing an alternative for um, uh, the, uh, this old paradigm. But uh, excellent books uh, of Vondrasek and Patton uh, and, and McMahon. But I'm a little, disappointed, a little bit disappointed at the end because the living system theory, in the end, it, it turns down at goal setting by conscious thinking. And if you look at the framework, which is the result of the system theory framework of career development, then you see that it's merely used as an instrument for collecting information about self and the world. So it remains very close to the old paradigm. And if you look at this famous book, um, many, many of the chapters, you can see always these words again, thinking, understanding, knowledge, self-knowledge, and knowledge of the uh, alternatives. But there are problems with this paradigm. And perhaps the, the most crucial problem is that thinking or true reasoning, as Parsons put it, is not able to direct ourselves, is not enough for making choices. We can see that, for example, in the famous case of Phineas Gage. He was a railway worker about 150 years ago and he had to work with dynamite for blowing up rocks for the railway. But he had an accident and a bar of iron was put in his head, through his head, 
and uh, damaged the, the fore part of his head, of his, his brains. The strange thing was that he recovered uh, very good, and after recovering, he was able to think very good. Uh, for example, Damasio writes about that. I quote, the instruments usually considered necessary and sufficient for rational behavior were intact in him. He had the requisite knowledge, attention, and memory. His language was flawless. He could perform calculations and he could tackle the logic of an abstract problem. So he was very well able at uh, true reasoning, but he was not able to direct his life and to make good choices for his career. And the same can be said about uh, patient R. She was a uh, businesswoman of high level, very intelligent, and she had also a problem in her forehead. It was a tumor that damaged this part of the brain. And afterwards, <clears throat> she was also, also very well able to, to, to perform thinking operations, and she had very high results on intelligence tests. And uh, notable, uh, important uh, to note is that she was able at self-knowledge and self-reflection, but she was not able at self-direction. So this is another example, and Elliot is another example, <clears throat> the thinking is not enough to guide our actions and to um, to make us make good choices, good decisions in our careers. Something else is necessary, but what is that? This part in the brain, a bit behind your nose there, the above part of your nose, it's called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And what it seems to do can be called effective forecasting. And effective forecasting is making scenarios uh, about what could happen and what you would do in those situations. But then also feeling, bodily feelings, uh, feelings from your body about how you would feel in that situation. And somatic markers is another theory, but it's about the same, that your body gives signals about what is good and what is not good and what's a good idea and what is not a good idea. And these signals have to be processed and incorporated in your decisions. And that's exactly what is happening there. So that was what patient R and Phineas Gage were missing. And in spite of their good reasoning and thinking uh, abilities, they were not able to make good choices. There's another reason, <coughs> excuse me, there's another reason why uh, the old paradigm has problems, and that is that it's completely focused on the conscious part of our functioning, the, our conscious thoughts, our conscious actions, but uh, in, uh, since F Sigmund Freud, and of course, much more since these last two, three decades, we know very well that unconscious processes are very, very important and form a very big part of us, perhaps not visible, but they are very much influencing our thoughts and influencing our actions without we, our knowing exactly what is happening. And our theories, our, our career theories, are, in my view, too much concentrated on only the tip of the iceberg. So the question is, what should we do uh, to incorporate this all in a new theory, in a new view of career development? Before going to um, one of the authors that is saying interesting things about this, I would like to ask you a second question. Syria, will you start the second poll question? So I launched the poll questions, but let me read the uh, uh, experiment. So suppose you are asked to participate in a medical experiment, but unfortunately it will be very painful. But afterwards you will receive a pill that will completely wipe out any memories of the episode. Will, 
you will not experience any negative consequences. What is the smallest reward that you will make you participate? You can then answer. And we got the result. And 48% of attendees answered, no reward will make me participate. 21% answered $100,000. Uh, and 13% answered uh, $10,000. 13% uh, answered $1,000. And only 4% answered $100. OK. Thank you very much. Very interesting to see these results. This question and this kind of questions is asked by Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize for his work on related fields. And what he's saying, and I hope this question makes it clear, is that there's a difference between our remembering self and our experiencing self. Uh, this audience in this webinar does not seem really representative for the populations that Kahneman has uh, researched because his conclusion is that many, many people are uh, quite indifferent uh, about their experiencing self. Um, he concludes that many people uh, are ready to, um, to, to undergo an operation like that even for a small reward uh, when it's guaranteed that you don't remember and it's guaranteed that you have no negative consequences. And he concludes, um, odd as it may seem, uh, I am my remembering self. That's that identification with the remembering self. And the experience self, who does my living, is like a stranger to me. Um, so what he says is that what he says is that um, we seem to live for our memories more than for our experiences. We have we try to have good memories more than we have tried to have good experiences. Another author writing about uh, conscious and unconscious processes um, in this domain is Ab Dijksterhuis. He is a Dutch uh, social psychologist. Um, this book, unfortunately, has not been translated in English, but we can translate the title as the, the Smart Unconscious Thinking with Feeling. Uh, you can read, of course, uh, peer-reviewed scientific articles of him in the literature and also articles of uh, related uh, researchers like uh, Jonathan uh, Schooler or Timothy Wilson. And what all these authors show is that conscious thinking impairs achievements in many circumstances. Uh, it's contrary, it's contrarious to what many people uh, uh, expect. Um, but for example, face recognition, wine tasting, it goes better if, if you do it without conscious thinking and without verbalizing, without putting words to it. More relevant for the career domain uh, is that in complex, ambiguous or changing situations, like many career situations, unconscious thinking leads to better decisions than conscious thinking. So for example, an instruction to uh, sleep a night over it or to do something completely different and to let distract yourself leads to better decisions than an instruction to verbalize to um, verbalize your arguments or to, uh, to to put effortful thinking in it this is the third book um, which i liked about this subject jane mcgilchrist is a psychiatrist a british psychiatrist who devoted a very large part of his life uh, studying the brain and in particular the left and the right side of the brain uh, the two hemispheres he has been applauded by many neuroscientists for his work. And what he says is that um, the left hemisphere should uh, play a role uh, as an emissary. And it, it's, it's to say as, a, as an assistant or um, an instrument in the service of the master. And the master should be the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, because this side of the brain is able to 
experience the self in context. Um, and um, uh, the emissary is very good in ver verbal goal-directed thinking, but this should be in the service of the master. But what has happened, uh, according to him, is that the left side of the brain, uh, because of this very powerful weapon of language, um, has developed such a power that it is dominating the right side of the brain. The master is put in the cellar and the emissary is taking all the decisions. If you take these three books, and of course there are many uh, schoolers that, that have written similar sh uh, things, if you take them together, of course they are different. Eh? Kahneman uh, writes about thinking systems, um, Dijkstra House about um, processes eh, in the brain, processes of thinking, and McGilchrist about structures. But nevertheless, there is a big overlap. And let's put on this uh, sheet. This um, shows that uh, conscious thinking is merely serial process, like as if all bits of data have to be processed by a kind of bottleneck. And on the other hand, unconscious thinking works with many parallel processes at once. So the capacity of the unconscious thinking to process a lot of data is very much greater, much bigger than of conscious thinking. Conscious thinking is effortful and slow. Conscious, uh, unconscious thinking is effortless and fast. On the left side, here we see the, the capacities to classify, to analyze. And at the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere has the capacities for aha, erlebnisse, or sudden discoveries, insights, uh, intuitions, and also dreaming. Conscious thinking applies rules. Thinking rules is algorithmic. And the right side is more associative and heuristic. Conscious thinking works with verbal representations, stories, and they People are encouraged to do so in career guidance, for example. But the right side is in the living reality, in the, has the here and now experiences. The left side of the brain is directed at self, is a bit egocentric. And the right side is more directed at context, at uh, the other. Conscious thinking, eh? the left side is more positive, more sensitive to positive feedback. Is uh, considering that as encouragement and therefore uh, persists in reaching goals. The right hemisphere is more sensitive to negative feedback and has more a tendency to stop what you're doing and to do something else. It's bored more, more easily. The left side is overconfident and dominating. The right side is modest and speechless. And the crucial point is probably that we identify with this left side, this conscious side, this tip of the iceberg, and we we don't know even had this speechless side, but unfortunately this side could better represent us, uh, represent ourselves in context. So how can we um, make these ideas part of, of a new theory, new practices in, in career guidance. Like many other authors, I think uh, system theories are very promising for de developing an alternative. And here in this uh, sheet, I have shown the basic cybernetic structure. Cybernetics, of course, is the science of steering, of governing, of finding direction. And such systems work as an input-output system, and the input is perception, and the output is behavior. For example, uh, you feel a bit chilly. Uh, there's a comparator that compares your feeling, your input, uh, your perception, with a desired perception. And if it concludes that they are not the same, then there is some output, for example, uh, taking a pullover, and this has an effect, uh, you get more comfortable. This is the new input in the circular process. And the comparator concludes that now it's okay and no behavior at this moment. This is a very 
ubiquitous, uh, universal uh, process, very common in nature. Perhaps even it's the, the crux of nature, this kind of, of systems. Because in such a way, even the tiniest uh, organisms are able to survive, to maintain a homeostasis, even if there are disturbances in the environment. For people, it's a bit too simple uh, as, a, as a description of our behavior. It's much more complicated. But perhaps you have already wondered, where does the desired perception come from? And in many theories, this comes from uh, likewise uh, systems, like uh, systems that are similar, but that are organized in levels. Um, and the levels above uh, command the desired output to the levels below. One of these the theories is the perceptual, perceptual control theory. And it supposes that um, on the lowest level, there are already 800 uh, of this kind of cybernetic structures. And above that, there are 10 levels which are governing this executing level. And unfortunately, we have not time enough to, to explain all of this, but let me, let me say that well, I think it's interesting that thinking, um, conscious thinking, is uh, merely taking place or at mo mostly taking place at the ninth level, the program level. Their programs are made to reach goals, uh, but below that are the um, systems that execute the programs. But above that are two layers in this theory. And level 10 the principles you can compare to, to values. And level 11 you can compare to identity. And from these levels, uh, which are not uh, really conscious, commands are given to the program level. And the program level should execute them. And then should give you orders to below. Um, where further execution takes place. Some characteristics of the, the PCT, the perceptual control theory, that is that behavior is the control of perception. It's a radical, quite radical new view because many theories see uh, the control of output uh, as, as more important. But here it says that no, what we control is perception, and not the output. We control our, our own temperature, our perception of temperature, but not uh, controlling what we do exactly. Uh, one action can have the same result as another action, for example. The word control is here, in, of course, in uh, uh, systems language. And it means uh, keeping uh, something between certain limits, uh, homeostasis at a certain level. The second characteristic is that uh, uh, control or uh, direction finding is a, is a dynamic circular process with continuous bottom-up uh, information uh, in terms of perceptual input and top-down uh, information in terms of expectations and desires and desired perceptual inputs and feedback from the environment. And notable, uh, we should note that there's no single part of the system that is controlling the whole of the system. The control is diffuse in the whole of the system. That is not a part that you could call an I or a self that is commanding how the rest should operate. Below there are some um, uh, qualities of the theory, but we will skip that for the moment uh, because time goes on. And many of you are come, have, have come for ACT and we have not yet uh, arrived at that one. Uh, it's because I think personally that the questions that are, po uh, are uh, stated here are perhaps more interesting than the answers. Perhaps. Let me note uh, one key point, uh, which I think is a key point, and that is that how it often goes and how it is encouraged in much career practices is that thinking is commanding our actions. But how it should go, in my opinion, uh, is that um, values and identity should comment our actions. And thinking 
should be in an assisting an emissary role, an advisory role. So in organization terms, thinking should be like a staff department, but it should not be the CEO or the, the board of directors. And one reason is that um, if thinking uh, is at the head of the organization, then thinking has a very big uh, capacity to confirm confirmation. So um, people are very good in showing that they are right and to in make interpretations of their experiences as if it was were, uh, as expected. Uh, you are always right. But if it's so the, if thinking is not at the head of the um, organization, then there are more possibilities of adapting our thinking and actions. And that, of course, is very crucial for future um, careers. Perhaps I can just tell one example. It was a man on a bicycle I met in Eastern Europe, and he went all the way to the Middle East, uh, mile after mile, it was his plan he was executing, his goal was going to the Middle East, but he did not like at all doing what he did. He was always afraid of cir uh, the circulation, the traffic, the, the noise was boring. When he came into a town he was interested, but he could go nowhere because he was afraid that his, that his things would be stolen. I think the tragic thing was that the thinking was his goals were dominating his actions. And if it were values, for example, ideas, images of bicycling in a nice way, then he would have had a better chance to adapt his plan. And unfortunately, this, I think, is happening in many careers. People who are realizing their goals, but nevertheless, their experiencing self is miserable and is sad because something important in their values is not realized. And perhaps, according to McGilchrist, this is happening in our society on a larger scale as well. Many societies, many uh, countries are very well re arriving at realizing goals with values like good living in accordance with nature is, is perhaps uh, missing in, in, uh, to a large extent. Then uh, ACT. Uh, acceptance and commitment approach. What can ACT, uh, what has ACT to do with it and, and why I am advocating ACT? It started as a therapy uh, in the 1990s by Stephen Hayes, uh, but now it is uh, applied in many preventional contexts and also by non-therapists, non-professional people. You can call it a movement, an approach. It has a rather solid theoretical foundation it's the relational frame theory. And this theory shows interesting things about the role that language can play in causing all kinds of trouble. ACTIS has a proven effect effectiveness in many therapeutic and preventive contexts. And in my opinion, uh, it offers a vision on uh, human nature that is both sophisticated and needed. What I mean is that I think ACT finds a good middle way between, let's say, a Western way of thinking about commitment and goal achieving and uh, making things work in the world. And on the other hand, at the same time, uh, an acceptance um, side that says we have to accept things that we cannot change and we have to be in the here and now. ACT can be described and is often described in six core processes with uh, as a central goal psychological flexibility. Together with uh, my colleague Albert de Volter, uh, we have developed a toolkit in the Netherlands also around these six um, processes. Let me start explaining at the commitment side, committed action, it means that you uh, really try to, to live the values that you have chosen, even if you are a bit afraid that you might fail, or even if you are a bit afraid that you make uh, a strange impression on other people. And it is committed action. 
self as context is uh, considering um, yourself as a kind of space in which you can observe all kinds of actions, of, uh, of thoughts and feelings. So it's a space and you can observe your thoughts and feelings, but uh, from a kind of, of distance, you don't identify with them. And in particular, uh, stories about yourself or descriptions of yourself in traits, um, you don't take them too seriously. One of the exercises that uh, you can do, very simple, is uh, you let uh, write down a person uh, phrases like I am, and they fill out, for example, I'm a really kind person or I'm a real extrovert. And then you can ask them to um, wipe them out or to cross them out. And then you can talk about what feelings that, that makes, eh, that, that, that gives, like, for example, people can become a bit uh, aggressive. Uh, when they uh, wipe out parts of what they see as their identity or they may feel liberated. It can be productive to talk about it. But it can also be productive to, to show and to, to talk about the fact that very often people can justify exactly the other thing also. I mean, if they say they are introverted, they can also say in other situations, I'm extroverted. And so then you are uh, talking about um, an interplay between the person and the situation which is interesting and which helps um, not to identify with fixed traits and in this way it helps for psychological flexibility. Cognitive diffusion is taking distance uh, of your own thoughts, not identifying with them, not uh, assuming that what you think is true. Um, and one simple exercise that we have in our toolkit is that we ask a person <clears throat> to write down on this kind of uh, sticky notes thoughts that come up um, when you think about uh, your career question uh, as fast as you can. And every little note, uh, you uh, write another thought. And after a while, you take these thoughts together and you put them, for example, in a wall and you can literally take some distance towards your thoughts. And even if it is a very simple exercise, it can be productive because it can give intuitions or insights like uh, this goes with that or uh, um, actually all these thoughts turn around the same theme or I see two signs in these thoughts and this can be very productive. Acceptance is about accepting things and um, especially interesting are things in your head, eh? your thoughts or feelings, things you don't want to feel, for example, pain. Nevertheless, you accept that they are there uh, or irritating thoughts, same, same way. And what is shown in much research is that if you do that, you are less bothered, you, they're less um, troublesome than when you try to fight these things in your head that you don't want to accept, which you don't want you to have. One uh, interesting thing in, in, in our career guidance, I think, is that we apply this uh, to the anxieties that, that many young people, but also ad adults, have about their career questions. And for example, we help them accept that you can never be sure and that uh, when uh, your thinking is not enough and your information is not enough to, to be sure about whatever you will choose. That it's always a step uh, in the dark. Uh, of course, you have to prepare it as good as you can, but accept that, uh, that it's difficult. Contact with the present moment is uh, another word is mindfulness. And perhaps I can illustrate this by just asking you to participate in a few moments of mindfulness. I would like to ask you to, uh, just for a few moments, <coughs> to close your eyes and to sit comfortable in your chair or wherever you are and to just let the sounds that are there come into your ears. This 
is a very short uh, exercise of, of mindfulness. It means uh, uh, that you make a contact with the present moment, in this case, in the form of sounds. And of course, there are many uh, sophisticated, very, uh, very good exercises that exist about mindfulness. Values is what you really find important. And in this um, sheet, uh, I have mentioned two uh, definitions from the ACT field. Uh, chosen life directions is one of them. And chosen uh, qualities of purpose, purpose of action that can never be obtained as an object, but can be instantiated moment by moment. It's a definition perhaps that demands some studying to fully understand it. It's perhaps a little bit vague, but that's true for many things about values and about the upper layers in our control hierarchy. We can say that, that images work better on this side. Yeah? For example, think about the bicycle man, images of, of activities, uh, doing things in a certain way, in a certain situation works well for values. Goals, on the other hand, are attainable ends of programs, um, programs in the sense of uh, action programs to, to, to reach goals. They're formulated in language or in numbers, uh, more a question in the, in the left hemisphere. They are concrete and clear. Often our clients are encouraged by uh, our counselors to make goals as concrete, concrete and clear as possible. Goals have risks of frustration, where the goal is missed, for example. Uh, people can be discouraged. But also when a goal is achieved and immediately replaced for another goal, and it's what happens often with goals, it's frustrating also. Uh, think about uh, the, the person who wants uh, has a nice car, but next car must be nicer and afterwards nicer, or more and more money, or less or less kilograms uh, for uh, in the case of anorexia. Um, while values are intrinsically satisfying and motivating when you are uh, realizing at least a part of it, doing things the way you do it, they are intrinsically motivating. There's no end state. And one example is uh, become a doctor is a goal, but helping in a caring way people who suffer from physical problems is in act considered a value. And of course, you see how this can help our flexibility because this value you can realize in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of settings and situations and levels. So what can ACT, what does ACT contribute to uh, career guidance? Um, reliable input, eh? we have seen that input, perceptual input is crucial for good uh, cho choosing. So that's where mindfulness helps. Reliable perceptual input. It helps to create a calm atmosphere um, in which quiet inner voices may be heard. Values uh, help to find direction and to find goals, uh, overarching uh, goals. Self as context helps against foreclosure and a premature clinging to an identity. And rumination, it's tragic that many young people ruminate already, are worrying too much about the future. And act as a whole helps a lot for career adaptability, psychological health and resilience. One implication is that I think there's a lot of work to do uh, at the scientific foundations of our field. Our field is to a too large extent uh, influenced by some old common sense ideas. And there's many research um, for uh, research from new fields like neurosciences, developmental psychology, and many others that are not incorporated in our field. Um, for practice, don't put too much of an emphasis on information seeking and conscious thinking. Offer and encourage diverse experiences. 
trust unconscious processes and get inspiration from the acceptance and commitment approach. For example, a counseling for values clarification and practice and encourage mindfulness. I see that um, the quarter of an hour that we have reserved for questions is now beginning. So I would like to refer you to some sources on this sheet. Um, of course, you will have the sheets uh, afterwards. Um, uh, Cervic will uh, uh, furnish you a link uh, to, to get them. And otherwise, if you are in a hurry, you can mail me also and I will send them immediately. Here are the references. I hope they will inspire some further study in some of you. So I think now is the time for, for questions. Cyril, are there any questions that have arrived? Thank you, Tom. So yes, as you said, it's time now for the question and I assign uh, some, of, uh, some of them to you. And uh, please, for those of you who haven't sent your question yet, you can still do it by using the question slash chat box that you can see on your screen. So Tom, are you able to see the first question? Or would you want to? No, unfortunately not, no. Okay, so oh, the I first question. Uh, no, I cannot see any question now. Okay, so we have a question from André asking, did Michael Christ take into account left-handed individual versus right-handed individual as separated test group? Uh, no, uh, left and right hemisphere, of course, are, are not uh, separated. If I did understand the question well, um, we can say that um, um, everything we do, uh, both left and right hemisphere, are working in it. The right hemisphere all the time gives ideas about what you want to say and, and gives ideas about the whole. And the left hemisphere uh, finds the words and, and puts grammar in order. And everything you, which you do, you, you need both, uh, that we can say. So there are many uh, perhaps misunderstandings about this, that, that some people are typically uh, left-handed and other uh, uh, left-brained and other typically right-brained, as if for them the left does not work, uh, does not cooperate. But this is um, a too simple way of seeing it. Did, did I understand the question right? Or? And we'll ask Andrew to follow up if not. So thank you, Tom. I have another question from Kevin. How do you put this into practice in everyday employment counseling? Well, um, <clears throat> I think um, the ideas about the perceptual control theory and uh, the paradigm I think there's a lot of work to do uh, to, to put them um, in, uh, in practice because I think new theories are necessary and practices that are based on them. But for now, I think ACT, the acceptance and commitment uh, approach, offers numerous uh, possibilities. Um, it's quite fresh, uh, Albert de Folter and I, when we started, we have asked around if there were more people uh, trying this, this thing. But, we were the first we knew about, of course, now it's, we are a few years later, perhaps now there are more people to, to ask inspiration. But, uh, well, I think uh, this web, uh, the PCT web, offers many uh, uh, ideas. And mindfulness, for example, I think it's, it's a very universal um, thing to practice. And in, in uh, employment counseling, uh, I think in the beginning already it helps it's very good to create a good atmosphere, uh, a calm atmosphere, in which uh, you can communicate uh, more freely, more openly than when you are very much at this left side of the brain thing. For, I have to go, I have to, to, I have to finish uh, this part of the conversation in cinq minutes. So um, that's where mindfulness comes in. But um, yeah, also, things about values finding and uh, uh, there is one thing that, that the perceptual control theory has developed and that's a method of levels. Now it is uh, merely uh, applied in therapy, but I think it would be very, very good to, um, to develop also a version for career questions and employment uh, counseling. And that is about uh, resolving conflicts that people may have on the higher levels of their control hierarchy. It means uh, their values or their identity. 
perhaps I can add that the most uh, essential thing in it is, is putting direction to those questions and, and not thinking that you can resolve them by, by good thinking, uh, by true reasoning, but thinking can help to put attention. And um, after that, you have also to confide in unconscious processes that you put to work in this way. Thank you, Tom. Um, and actually, I got a question uh, from a civil person who, which follow more or less what you just said is like, what is uh, the way that we can help client clarify their own value? Uh, Rebecca said, for example, that sometimes it's even I'm not even sure what is my own value are. So how can we help the client to clarify theirs? Well, together with Albert, uh, we have uh, written a blog on the CERIC site about uh, discovering values. And it's, uh, for example, a card set that we uh, mention. Uh, you can find a card set and you could translate it in, uh, in your own language uh, if you like. You can find it in, in the site uh, Act in LOB, EU Home. Uh. So th that are some instruments that can help uh, to, to find, uh, to, to clarify values. But also this method of levels, uh, putting uh, attention to the question itself uh, can already help to to resolve um, um, conflicts and, and to, to, cl to clarify uh, values. So uh, crucially, I think some instruments like value cards and um, a question a list of questions can help, but a conversation afterwards about interpreting uh, these words, uh, that's important. And, perhaps you can keep in mind also uh, the um, definition of values. As an example, uh, suppose that uh, a client says that he has as a value to become rich. It happens quite a lot in, in young people. Then this value is not a form uh, that is really very useful. So when you ask uh, what would you do if you were rich, it becomes much more uh, informative, it, it's much more um, rich in information, um, because then you, you get to, uh, to situations and to what you would do in situations, and that's more the value talk of acts and the, the value talk of the right side of the brain. So becoming a millionaire is a goal, but um, uh, going into to, uh, sailing a yacht uh, might be more like a value. Of course, there are many definitions of values. And one definition is also that it has to, to do much, much something with other people, huh? um, with the society. A real value um, links your own needs with links of the society. That can be a clue also to work on values with clients. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I have a question from Heather. I have in the past worked in the North with unemployed trade men who are not self-reflective or mindfulness type. How would you coach those type of person? Um, well, self-reflection, uh, as I have uh, noted, is not really um, the biggest thing or the most important thing. I think it's good to do it a little bit, but not too much. Uh, what is more important, I think, is to uh, have experiences. So I think for almost every client to encourage uh, having experiences is a very good, um, very good way. Um, and then uh, so often you can trust on, on the unconscious um, processing of the information a person uh, obtains. Uh, I notice also that in many schools, for example, the teachers or the career gu uh, guidance counselors have the impression that um, people remember only things when you talk about it, but think about, for example, these experiences with face recognition and wine tasting, then you can see that verbalizing is disturbing in a certain way, uh, these processes of, of um, remembering. So people remember many things and uh, verbalizing is not necessary and sometimes even uh, disturbing. Of course, it's a way for the guidance counselor or the teacher to control the process, but it's not always in the interest of the client. Uh, so having experiences, uh, not 
talk too much about it. Eh? Talking is uh, uh, especially useful for directing attention, but not for resolving problems. And uh, the last thing, uh, perhaps um, mindfulness. Uh, I think it's true that many people uh, don't like the idea of mindfulness. And I have encountered, uh, I've met many people who are uh, allergic or have a kind of aversion to anything which has to do with yoga or mindfulness. Um, I don't really have um, a solution for that, but I'm sure that that authors like Kabat-Zinn, eh, Jon Kabat-Zinn, who has introduced mindfulness in the Western world when he worked with uh, cancer patients who were, were in pain. Uh, I'm sure that his books, his workings, his manuals offer many techniques to um, to 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 convince people of the usefulness and the, good, the very good value of mindfulness. And also, uh, I've noticed in schools that when the teacher or the, or the counselor, the guidance personnel uh, herself or himself has confidence in mindfulness and these related techniques and presents them in a, in a, in a familiar way as if it speaks for, from his, itself, then many uh, children even uh, are able and willing um, to, to participate in this kind of exercises and experience how useful they can be. Thank you, Tom. And that was the last question for today. It was really great to see all those questions coming throughout the webinar series, including today's webinar. So thank you all for your great engagement. And for those of you who haven't had their question answered today, I will invite you to contact Tom to continue the conversation with him. Tom, a huge thank you for your presentation today. We got a chance to rethink the way career theories and practice work and how the acceptance and commitment therapy can help us to innovate in our practice. So thank you for that. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, in a week from now, we will email you a link to the recording of this webinar along with a copy of the slide. Now you can learn more about the Career Theories and Model at Work book, including how you can get your own copy at seric.ca slash theories. Now to continue your learning journey, we are happy to share a few webinar series happening this fall. A webinar series in intergenerational trauma with Shona Cresset and Tina Marie Christian on November 14, 21 and 28, and in partnership with CCPA, and two free webinars presenting the final report of the two CEREC funding research project. Please visit our website at ceric.ca webinars for more information. We are pleased to announce that the 2019 survey of career service professional is now opened. This comprehensive survey is only run once every four years and presents a critical opportunity to take a snapshot of the pr profession and how it has changed over time. So please visit seric.ca slash survey 2019 to complete your survey. Finally, we are delighted to say that the preliminary program of the Canexis National Career Development Conference is now available on our Canexis website. Please visit canexis.ca for more information or to register. The early bird deadline is November 6. Now it's time for you to tell us what you thought of this webinar today and to tell us more on your future learning needs. So a short evaluation survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webinar ends. We will really appreciate you providing us with your feedback. Let me now close by thanking you, the participant, once again for your wonderful engagement across the world. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you at another learning opportunity. Have a good day.